Well, I want to welcome in all locations with us. The online family, how are you this morning? Uh, Paulden, I know you're out there. Welcome to you. Prescott, welcome to you. How are we? You sound really, really good. I'm just, I'm just going to throw it out there that if we are ever looking for a choir, this service right here, right now, y'all are the choir. We're just, just saying, but um, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, if, if you're new to this space or maybe the online family new to that space, um, I, I just want you to know, like you've been welcomed multiple times, but I want you to know you belong here. And by that, I mean that, that you don't have to pretend to be somebody you're not. You, you don't have to believe the right things or feel like you got to fit a certain way um, to belong. Uh, we just want you to know that because you're human, you belong. And, and that's the same for me. It's the same for anybody else in here that we believe we have a God who created space for us. We, we have a God who accepts us as we are. And the journey of faith is really long. And so I just want you to know that we're, we're not like, hey, you belong here, but once you believe, then you're really in. Like, I want you to know that, that no, we believe that because you're human, God loves you an awful lot, and so do we. And, and we know that this journey of faith takes time, and, and it, it's, it's a process that only you can walk for you. And we're just, could not be more excited that we get to walk with you. And those of you that call Heights home, welcome to you. Glad, glad that you're with us. Glad that you are able to be here today. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, did you notice that summer's here? You notice that? And then next week it'll be winter again. And then the week after, maybe spring. We'll see. But welcome to Arizona where you just get it all at, all at once. But um, we're, just, we're just grateful that we get to do this. And, and like Todd said, we are leaning into... Uh, just a whole new series. Uh, what about 85? And it's, it's actually a series about the speed limit and how it should change because y'all drive 85 on the freeway anyways. You know what I mean? You see the 75 and you're like, well, that means 85. We're in Arizona. And so, uh, but uh, I had another guy ask me, is this the management principle? And I was like, I don't think so because I don't know what that is. And so he went on to explain this morning and um, it's amazing just standing in the, in, in the lobby space where that's here, even online chatting with Pastor Owen, like you just learn stuff that you never knew before. And so I learned all about a management principle this morning, which was awesome. Um, but we're not talking about management principles. We're not talking about speed limits. We're talking about age. What about 85? Like, like let me ask it a different way. Who are you going to be when you're 85? And here's what's weird. Like, even just hearing that, some of you are like, if you're like my mom, I was talking to her on the phone last night. She's like, I don't know if I want to live that long. I'm ready to go see Jesus, right? Some of you are like, I don't think, John, I'm making it to 85, if I'm honest with you, man. I, I know my life, probably not going to make it. But, but here's the thing. If you think culturally, culturally, we, we live in a, in a system that gears you for this magic number. And the magic number is whenever you can afford to retire. So, so, so may, for, the, for the average person, it's 65. They're trying to push you later to 67, right? You can claim more when you get to 67. But whatever that happens to be, there's this built-in thing into our, our culture that kind of drives us um, along this path that, that okay, you, you hit your 20s and you pick out what job you want. And once you have that job and career, now you get into that and it's exciting at first. And then you get to your 30s and you still have this like dream that you can change the space you're in and, and make it better. And then by your 40s, you realize that ain't going to happen. And, and so now you're depressed through your 40s and you get to 50 and you're like, okay, 15 more years, I get to make the magic number. And then you get to 65 and you're like, yes, I get to enjoy my life. Well, I was talking to a guy recently, true story, in Prescott. He, he retired at 65, got his house that he wanted, got everything he kind of built for. And, and it was about two years into it. And his wife's like, you need to go do something. <laughs> yeah. I can see somebody clapping. So there's a true story. But, but what he said was this, that he got bored. That he got to do those things he enjoys, and he's like, I'm kind of bored. So guess what he did? He got a part-time job. 
He went back to work. True story. Because he wanted to be around people and, and he needed something in his life that carried meaning to it. What about 85? What if we ask the question, who am I going to be at 85? And we lived in intentionality to get there. What, what could that look like for you? And this whole thing is, is kind of built on this idea of there's a portion of scripture and it's not used very often. And we're just going to dig into it for about four weeks and see what the Lord does. Um, see what he, he unearths for us. But, but I was reading this, this um, book, and it's by a lady named Shauna Nyquist. And, and she was talking about a conversation with her grandma. Her grandma was 82. And her grandma started talking about life. And they were looking at pictures. And, and as, as her grandma began to um, kind of talk about different moments and different pictures and different memories, her grandma started talking about this idea of a life inside of a life. That she says, I've lived so many lives packed into this one. And I don't know if you're familiar with Russian nesting dolls. or, but, but the idea that as we go through life, there's all of these moments, all of these lives that get packed into this one big life. Like if you think about it, those of you that survived elementary, those of you that are still in elementary school and mid-high, I'm sorry. Like, you will survive, I promise. Just keep going. Just keep going. It gets better. But, but you know, middle, middle school and ele- middle school for sure is just weird for everybody. Um, but, you know, you hit, you, you hit elementary school and middle school, but when you're 30, that's like this little life that was packed way back. But when you're 10, it's everything, the friendships, the, the moments at school, what you find that you like, and s- discovering your identity in middle school. Well, maybe not, but, you know, trying to. And, 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 you know, you hit high school, and, man, high school is like, that's everything, right? You know, especially if you're from a small town, it's like, I put all my years into high school, like, I was the captain of the football team, right? And then you get away from high school, and you realize the world is really big, and nobody cares about your high school, you know, that moment. <laughs> And, and, but it's this whole life where, man, I was the captain of the, of the football team. You ever met somebody that they never got past that moment of their life? That they're still living the old days, man. Remember the old days when we were on the field together? And it's like, dude, you're like 60 now. That was a long time ago. But, but, it, but it's this reality that, that high school was this life that's packed into a life. And then you go to college. And, and, and in college... We all make stupid decisions, but, but college becomes this defining moment of, man, I'm trying to pick out what career I'm going to go into. And, and then you get like three years into that career and you're like, I really don't like this field, right? But, it, but it's this life. College is this moment that feels like this part of life that's kind of inside its own. And then, and then you end up meeting somebody, you get married, and then you have these things called kids. <laughs> and you just hope, dear God, don't let me screw them up. Right. That's that's the prayer of every parent. Lord, don't let me screw them up. Let them turn out to be, you know, civilians that actually give back, you know, like. But but the hope is that they follow Jesus and you give everything you can for your kiddos to follow Jesus. And so there's this whole life of parenting where you just pour yourself out for years and years and years. And, and it's the most selfless thing you do. Um, parent or kids in the room, be nice to your parents. They're trying to figure it out. They don't have it all together. Kids in the room, you'll be a parent someday and you'll realize I don't have it all, right? At 20, I was like, I know everything. At 40, I'm like, I know nothing, right? And, 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 but it's this reality that, that all of these lives are packed inside of a life and they build up to this one big life. And, and I, I want to challenge you with something today, just a thought. That, that your faith of tomorrow is built in today. Your faith of tomorrow is built in today. Okay, so I, I learned something this week, by the way, that, that you'll forget an awful lot of what I say unless you write it down, unless you make a note of it, unless you go back and watch it. So those of you that aren't taking notes, go back and watch this later, right? And just catch that one line. Your faith of tomorrow is built in today. The, 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 the faith that it's going to take at 85 to be who God is calling me today, he's building that today. Don't miss it today. 
Okay, and so we're going to lean in. Like I said, we got a story. Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Those of you that aren't familiar with the Bible, it's in the front quarter of the Bible. And if you hit Judges, you went too far, so just back up a little bit. But Joshua chapter 14. And, and there's characters in here that you go, man, I, John, I'm not familiar with Scripture. Like, there's a lot of names coming out. Just, just hang on. Just we'll read it through, then we'll go back and do some Bible literacy stuff and get us all on the same page, and then we'll kind of wrap up this whole, whole conversation. But in verse 6, it says this, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, Caleb is the one we're going to be talking about, so hold on to the name Caleb. Caleb, son of Jephani, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to Caleb, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about the wilderness. So here I am today. So this is Caleb speaking. Here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Come on, somebody. 85 years old. And he's like, I'm ready. I'm as strong. I'm as vigorous. I got my sword in hand. Let's go take the giants. Okay, if you don't have a picture of what you want to be at 85, that's who I want to be. The guy who's going, you know what? I'm still the same as I was 45 years ago. 45 years, he's waited for a promise. 45 years, we don't even wait 45 seconds on the Lord. 45 years, and he's going, I'm still as strong, I'm still as vigorous, and with the, don't miss it, with the Lord helping me, what he said is going to come true. Who do you want to be at 85? Man, I hope, I hope built into who you want to be is this person that's got so much faith in God that at 85, we're taking those giants. It's beautiful. But your faith at 85 is built today. And, and see, when he gets here, he goes, I was 40 years old. Now, now, we need to put a context around this, so bear with me. We're going to walk through the Bible together. we got to go all the way back to the beginning. And, and in the beginning, God created. And you're like, oh, we're going all the way back to the beginning. Yes, all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Meaning, in the beginning, he created home for humanity. In the beginning, God put it all together. Why? So that he could put these things called humans into this place that he created for them to thrive. Everything was there that the humans needed to thrive. And in that space, those first humans were given a choice. Why a choice? Because those humans are made in the image of God. What is the image of God? God is love. So in that image of God, God being love, he gives them a choice. Why? Because love always requires a choice. Love always requires a choice. And so he gives them a choice to follow him or follow themselves. They choose to follow themselves and they become runaways running away from God as fast as they can. Everything they do is about running away from God, getting as far as they can, what feels good to them, what is about them. And so all of life is consumed with them as they run away. God comes in and he reaches down to a man named Abraham. And as he comes alongside Abraham, he goes, hey, Abraham, I'm going to bless the entire world through you. 
I'm going to create a nation out of your descendants. And I'm going to lead that nation into a promised land, a land that I have for them, a land that is flowing with milk and honey, meaning it's just sweet and abundant. It's the place you want to be. And so he walks with Abraham and then he walks with Isaac and Isaac has a kid named Jacob and Jacob ends up taking his family. And as he takes his family, he moves to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt in that process, God changes his name to Israel. And so now the nation of Israel is born, the nation that God is going to claim as his own people. And it's out of Jacob's descendants. And Jacob follows back to Abraham. So this family's been building, building, and now it becomes a nation. But the problem is this nation, this nation is under the oppressive rule of the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians make all the Israelites slaves. And it gets to the point where the Israelites, they got so many babies popping out that they go, you know what? We need to stop this. We're going to kill. So the Egyptians make a decree. We're going to kill every male that's born to the Israelites. And so the midwives who are helping give birth to the babies, they're going, you know what? We're not okay with this. We're going to serve God, not you. And so we're going to begin to hide the babies and make sure these males don't die. And one of those males that they hide is a man named Moses. And Moses gets put in a basket. He ends up floating down the river. He ends up at Pharaoh's house, the king's house. And Pharaoh's daughter scoops up this baby. And Moses is born in a palace instead of where he should have been with the Israelites. Now, Moses... As he's growing up, he begins to realize, wait, I'm an Egyptian, but I'm part, or I'm an Israelite, a part of the Egyptian household. And he begins to struggle with this tension of watching his people, the Israelites, watch them being persecuted and oppressed by the Egyptians, watching them get beat every day. And it begins to wear on him. He lets his anger get the best of him. He lashes out to save one of the Israelites from an Egyptian and in the process kills him. And he becomes fearful. And now Moses runs away. And Moses is gone 40 years. He's now 80 years old when God comes to him and says, Moses, I need you to go back and set my people free. And so Moses follows what God requests, goes back to Egypt and begins the process of setting God's people free. Now, what I need you to catch is this, because we're talking about Caleb. Caleb is 40 years younger than Moses, which means that Caleb was born a slave. Caleb was born in Egypt. Caleb was born with the death threat over his head. Why? Because he's a male baby being born to an Israelite in Egypt. And so Caleb is supposed to be put to death. We know Caleb survives because we have record of it. So now Caleb, under that oppression, he grows up. All of his early years, all of his preteen years are in in the reality of my family is slaves, everything we do is for this other nation, and we are treated harshly. We are mistreated. And now Caleb continues to grow. He gets to a point where he's going to have his family. He has his own family still as a slave. He doesn't get to choose what they eat, when they get up, when they go to work, what they produce. That's all chosen for him as a slave. Day after day after day after day, he is mistreated. And Caleb and his family grow up under this. And what Caleb gets to observe is an entire nation of people crying out to God, going, God, you have to save us. You have to rescue us. God, we can't put up with this anymore. We're breaking under the oppression of the Egyptians. And it's in that context. Can you imagine? He's been praying for years and years and years. And it's in that context that all of a sudden this man named Moses shows up. And Moses gets the the elders of Israel together and he goes, hey, God has sent me to set you free, which which you can imagine to Caleb and the rest of the Israelites. There's fear and there's excitement all at the same time, because how is this going to happen? And then Caleb gets to witness as God through Moses begins to perform miracles, as God through Moses begins to inflict these plagues onto the nation of Egypt. Right. That all of a sudden he watches flies come out of nowhere and there's a plague of flies and frogs and locusts and the river turns to blood and darkness that is so oppressive. And then God tells him, God tells Moses to tell the people the last plague is coming. And the last plague is the angel of death is going to pass over the entire nation. And when the angel of death comes, he's going to kill the firstborn kid of everybody in Egypt. 
And when this happens, Pharaoh will look at you and go, get out of here. I don't want you anymore. And so you can imagine, Caleb has a family. Caleb has a firstborn. Caleb takes what God has told him will save him, and it's a lamb. And it's the blood of this lamb that he's going to paint on the doorpost over his front door. And so Caleb takes and he paints the blood over the door. And God says that when I see the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, I will pass over that family and that family will be saved. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus. That in the blood of Jesus, you will be saved. When the blood of Jesus is on your life through faith, that you will be saved. It's a foreshadowing. And Caleb follows through and he paints the door and the angel of death comes and there's wailing throughout all of Egypt, but not in Caleb's house. Why? Because he followed what the Lord had told him. He got to see. And so all of a sudden, exactly as God said, Pharaoh goes, get out of here. I don't want you anymore. And so now Caleb gathers his family and they're going with the rest of the Israelites and they're following Moses. And they're like, Moses, where are we going? He goes like, I don't know, but not here. Right. And so he's like, I'm just following God. And so now they're out. And on the way, Caleb's family are grabbing gold and silver from who? From the Egyptians. They're looting them on the way out. And so now they got gold and silver, but they're in the desert. And God leads them up to the Red Sea. And Caleb can hear the Egyptians coming. He can hear them coming to kill him and his family. And so now they're barred up against the Red Sea. And God physically shows up and creates a barrier between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And then God miraculously parts the sea. And Caleb gets to walk on dry ground through the Red Sea. He walks across. Can you imagine that moment? And he gets to the other side. And when they all get to the other side, they watch the water as the Egyptians now come into the Red Sea. They watch the water swallow them up. All the latest weapons of the day, all the chariots made out of steel, they watch them swallowed up. And God saves them. And he watches. They put 12 stones and they stack them high as a memory to what God did. And then they carry on and they get into the wilderness and Caleb's there when the Israelites start to go, man, the food sucks here. The food was way better in Egypt. Did you bring us here just to starve? And he watches as God miraculously creates a dew that comes across the ground. And in the morning, that dew turns to frosted flakes because who doesn't like frosted flakes for breakfast? (laughs) It's sugary goodness, right? And so now this Frosted flakes are on the ground. And again, they begin to complain. They begin to go, the food was better. We had meat. And God goes, I'll provide meat. And so Moses now goes, God, you hold up. I just want to make sure you know what you're committing to. That if you provide meat for all these people, there's, there's no grocery stores. Like there, there, there's no accessible herds. We're in the wilderness. And God gets a little frustrated. And when God gets frustrated, he does crazy things. And one of those crazy things is he brings a wind. And in that wind is this thing called quail. And he says that the quail was three feet deep for as far as you could walk. Now, the hunters in the room just went, heck yeah, where's this lamb? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Three feet deep as far as you can walk. And Caleb's family was one. And it says that every family collected an average of 10 tons of quail staggering. And he got to experience it. He got to experience the the tabernacle set up where the Lord was coming to dwell. He got to experience that when the Lord's presence lifted up, the cloud lifted up and began to move, that it was time for them to move. And they'd move and they'd settle and they'd move and they'd settle. Why? Because they were following God every single step of the way. Then one day, one day God comes to Moses and he says, hey, I need you to tend, I need you to send out um, spies into the land. Send out one from every tribe, a leader from the tribes. And so now they're going through the tribes. And wouldn't you know it, Caleb is one of the leaders that's sent out. What are they spying out? The land that God promised way back here to Abraham. The land that was promised. I'm sending you to that land, the land that's lush and good and fresh. And Caleb gets out there with the other spies. And they begin to come back with grapes and pomegranates and figs. And they're like, oh, it's just like God said it was. And then 10 of them go, but man, the people are really tall. (laughs) And the walls are really high. And I don't think we can take it. And Caleb and Joshua are the only two 
They go, we can do this because God's with us. And the rest of the nation go, no, we can't. It's too much. And in that moment, God speaks to them and God makes it very clear that out of the entire generation, what did that mean? It meant that when they left Egypt, God took a census. And in that census, anyone who was over 20 years old, God said, you are not going to see the promised land because of your disbelief in this moment, your lack of faith in this moment. But Joshua and Caleb, both of you will see the promised land. In fact, I will give it to you as an inheritance. Joshua became the leader. Caleb now, in this moment, we get it, where he goes, I'm 40 years old when God made that promise. Guess what's happened in those 40 years, or 45 years, because God made him wait 45 years. He's watched an entire nation pass away. He's watched 22 and, or 20 years and up, he's watched everybody of that age die and pass away, and they've waited for 45 years. And only two of them are left. Guess what? You can be so close to the miracles. Because here's what's amazing. The entire generation also experienced everything that I just talked about. They experienced every moment. They experienced the Red Sea in the dry ground. They experienced God showing up in plagues. They experienced God leading them out. They experienced every single part that Caleb did, but they chose to not stand by faith. Your faith in your 40s is what's building your 85. You can be so close, church. You can show up here every single week. You can sing the songs louder than the person next to you. You can pray for a miracle and see it happen. You can watch the miracle in the neighbor around you. You can celebrate the baptisms last week. How incredible. How incredible. Yeah, we clap for baptism. Come on. But you can observe baptisms. You can watch life change. What I love about baptisms is life change. It's a testimony of life change. But you can watch all that. You can be close enough to clap. You can be close enough to cheer their name and completely miss God. Oh, you, you can see other people changed by Jesus and you can miss the Jesus that wants to change you. Oh, you can, you can build your life on a whole lot of things. You see, here's the thing, whether you realize it or not, you're building faith today. Your faith's in something today. We're not, we were made by God and we were made to walk by faith. And so you're building a life of faith right here, right now. But is what you're building today at whatever age you happen to be gonna be what sustains you in the life of 85 that God's calling you to be? Or are you gonna be at 85 like Caleb and go, man, I've seen some crazy stuff. But let's go take those giants. Because you're building faith in something. Here, here's what I mean. Some of you are building faith in your anger. And I know that sounds crazy. But some of you are holding on to your anger like it's all you got. And what you need to know is you're banking on, if I just stay mad enough and bitter enough and angry enough, I'll survive this life. But here's the problem. All those things only project onto other people and destroy everything you're around. Some of you are banking on your addiction is gonna get you through this life. That if I just keep numbing myself long enough, I'll never have to think about that. And so your faith is in the substance that you put into your body that you go, this will numb me away from reality. When God is calling you to walk by faith through your reality, because he wants to walk with you through it. There's some of you, you, you you're building this life on people and relationships. If I just get the right relationship, 
And so my faith is in that person. And here's the thing. I, I, I hate to break it to you, but people can't sustain you, the weight of you. They were never meant to. They're going to let you down. They're going to break your heart because they're not God. Only God can sustain the weight of your soul. They can't sustain the weight of your soul. And so you're essentially, you are just taking from them and taking from them and taking from them. And they're becoming a shell of who they were because you need this to sustain you. And by the time you're 85, it'll be broken and shattered. But you're building faith in something. You're, you're, you're building faith. That, that if it, in my whatever age, 40s, I build my faith on health, and I have this idea, right? If I just eat enough kale. If you eat kale, God bless you. I've tried kale every way you can have it. Smoothies with sugar, the whole works. It's still kale, right? So when you tell me you just haven't tried it right, I think I've tried it. Do yourself a favor and go get some fries. But, but here's, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing, no matter how hard you hit the gym, it can't sustain you. It can't. Your body will break down. No matter how much health food you eat, you will just be grumpy. <laughs> no, no matter how, how much health food you eat, because you're going to keep this thing healthy, because if I just keep it healthy, my faith is in my health to make it to 85. You'll be 85 and hungry. <laughs> I mean, come on, wealth. If the last three years have taught us anything, if inflation is teaching us anything right now, wealth is fleeting. It is not something you can build faith into and count on to be there when you need it. Because your faith for tomorrow is built in today. So what are you building your faith in? What are you counting on? Because what I know is what you build today, at some point you will go that. You ever, you ever sat with somebody who's older and, and, and they just go, that was a life, feels like a lifetime ago. And what they're saying is there was this whole life inside of a life, inside of a life that has made up who I am now. Church, I can't imagine a better, a better testimony to who God is than a group of people who rally around this person, Jesus, and take him for his word, and they build their faith in God can do anything, and I'm with that guy. And then we build this life, and, and we now have this church, and people look at us and go, you're a bunch of 85-year-olds, and you're known for going, let's take that hill. How good is that? That's way better than I get to 65 and get bored. But I walk with God and I go, I'm building faith in him and what he has and where he's going. I love it. Over the next weeks, we'll get into this. I don't know where God's leading us. I'll be honest with you. A lot of times we have series in there. Da, 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 da. This one is not, okay? There's some language here that we may explore. Things like he says, I've wholeheartedly followed you. Wholeheartedly meaning there's, it's not me. I'm not the one doing it but it's God and I'm with him. There's language in here is he's kept me alive for 45 years. Let's not be fooled. If we get to 85, it's not because we did something right. It's because God sustained our days. He's the only one that holds your days. He's the only one that holds your today. We don't know what we got, but let's build faith in him while we've got it. Another line in here is that the Lord will help me. Caleb recognizes I'm not the one who's going to take the giants. God's going to do it through me at 85. What's he doing through you at 25 today? What's he doing through you at 35? What's he doing with through you at 45? He's like, is he going to keep going? Yeah, 55. What's he doing with you at 55? In fact, I'll throw it a little higher because I met some people last service who were 92. What's he doing with you at 100? A hundo, let's go, right? Maybe that's what we should have called the series. A hundo, let's go. <laughs> but what I know is there's lives packed inside of lives. 
I have a moment in mind where I'm sitting on a bench, blind drunk, as well as high. I've broken every relationship around me that matters. I'm hanging out with people that say they love you. And it's in that moment that Jesus showed up and rescued me. In church, I've never been the same. I love that Pastor Ben this week in our teaching prep, he, he started talking about, you know, that those, there's those years that feel like they're wasted, but God's using them all. He's redeeming them all. Why? Because he's making this beautiful journey of faith. And he's working this journey of faith for what? For you to be who he made you to be. So who are you going to be at 85? Because what I do know is this, that who you are is 80, at 85 is built on your faith today. So let's take him at his word. Let's step across lines of faith we never have. And let's see what he does. Would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful. God, thank you for journeys of faith that we get to look at and be, God, inspired to follow you called to follow you, called to step out by faith. God, this morning in this room, across screens, into living rooms, into spaces where people are watching on phones, you're speaking. God, you're speaking here, you're speaking there. You're calling. God, I pray over our church family. I pray specifically for those that do not know Jesus today. Oh, they've heard about him. They've been around people that know Jesus. They could even tell you Bible stories, but they've never said yes to putting their faith in Jesus as their savior. If that's you today, and you know the Holy Spirit is calling you, it's real easy to cross that line of faith. If that's you, you just simply say, God, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me in Jesus. And you just let him know. For those of you that are in the room across the screens, God, we ask those of us that know you as our savior, we've crossed that line of faith. God, would you give us fresh eyes for 85? God, as we sing in a moment, would our hearts be captured by the idea of where we're standing today? Look where I am now because of what Jesus has done. God, would you lead us? Would you guide us? Would you encourage us? Would we leave here full of faith because of your Holy Spirit? We're so grateful that you love us. Thank you for the miracles. Would you build our faith today for what's ahead? It's in your name, everybody said. Amen.